do you need to consider partitioning? Another question. Partitioning is not always the answer. It can be a very useful thing. It costs money. Uh, it's a bit of a business decision there. Uh, sometimes partitioning that might be a good way to solve the problem without using partitioning. PL SQL can be used very, very effectively. One customer I'm working with right now is has a, a system where they have 100 megabyte network links between the database server and the application server. And in that case, it makes sense to do as much processing in the database as possible because moving it's very expensive and slow to move large amounts of data to the application server over a 100 megabit link, especially when we have a very fast connection to the storage and obviously very fast buses in between the memory and the CPU inside of that database server. Global performance views always start with the letter G. For the most part in Oracle, there's a, if you're used to querying Z dollar session, for example, you just put a G in front of it and then you get it across the entire cluster. That's kind of a good starting point. If you're looking for something in the cluster, you can almost always, very, very often, you can just put a G in front of it and query that thing. That's not true of the DBA tables. That's true of the, the Z dollar static tables that you see in there. And Jeremy, uh, one other item on the, uh, the data dictionary access. If you're using ASM, and you really should be, there are certain data dictionary views that are available uh, through the standard data dictionary when you're connected to the RDBMS instance. However, there are some pieces of information that are only available if you're directly connected to the ASM instance. Yep. Sorry for sorry yep, for that's... interrupting you guys. Um, I just have a quick message from Arup Nanda. He is uh, part right. of the audience today. Uh, he's probably the most famous DBA in the world, and he would have joined ex except that he is in a no noisy place right now with a lot of background noise, I guess. So he has asked me to say hello to everyone, to all the audience, on his behalf. Thanks, Arup. Thanks, Arup. Hi there. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let me talk about the redundancy. Why redundancy is crucial? Uh, although we have availability to give the in uninterrupted service, sometimes in order to prevent or eliminate single point of failures, you need to make sure that you have redundant components uh, at maybe data center level, software level, or hardware level. It could be like active-active, or maybe it could be active-passive. For an example, you can have multiple data centers at uh, geographically distant location. For example, maybe one city in another city, or maybe sometimes in one country to another country. So uh, this kind of setup, uh, people talk about like uh, the primary data centers and disaster recovery centers. So in case if your primary data center goes down completely, you can have the redundant in the DRC. So you can bring up the redundancy and then continue your service without any big troubles. At the same time, uh, let's talk about the data center. If you have a data center, I need to make sure the other critical resource units that runs in the data center are redundant. For example, like a power supply, air conditioning, and these things. If you have any one of them is not redundant, and you, you, you may see that you know if something goes wrong, it will affect the total data center. So you need to make sure these critical components are redundant. Uh, at the same thing, uh, same thing is at the database level as well. So you have a database. For example, if you have a, uh, let's talk about single database and rack database. So a single instance database is one to one. So in case that box goes down, so your database will not be accessible. At the same time, if you have a rack with multiple instances, if one node goes down, at least the other instances are active and they are receiving the request from the client, uh, the customers, and they don't feel any downtime. So what if, if your database goes down or maybe the whole cluster goes down? So you can have a redundant copy of the database which is like standby database or you can configure your database uh, to the data guard. So in case of your primary database goes down, your data guard, your standby database can, can be bring up and it can serve you without any interruptions. So can we go to the next slide please? All right, as I just said that uh, you can have redundancy level at software or hardware at any level. 
So for example, if you talk about software redundancy, you now just imagine you have a application that is accessed through the web, maybe internet and from other resources. So you can have multiple web servers configured to access your application. So if one web server goes down, the other server at least can serve the people. The same thing here, active passive or you can have active active to do the load balancing and as well as scaling the load connections. Also you do the same thing at your application level. If you have any applications that generates uh, reports, or maybe you have some batch processing and maybe monitoring tools or monitoring service. So these all these things are required in order to maintain the high availability. It's not necessarily at one data center or not at one level. Maybe you can have a, a other site as DRC where you can maintain the redundant copy of the software. So uh, you will not, uh, you will make sure that every time the all the time the services are up and running. Uh, same thing to the storage level, you can have multiple SANS storage uh, area networks with the different RAID levels to protect and mirror your data. Uh, next slide please. Exactly, so here we talk about the uh, individual components like uh, multiple network switches or maybe virtual LANs. So you can have redundant level, this can help you to load balance your traffic or maybe you know it can work as active or it can work as active passive to fail over you know in case one switch goes down the other one will will be active for you. The same thing also with the network interface cards so you can have redundant cards in order to avoid any single point of failure to your connection to the connection to the card. Also like uh, as I said like power, cooling, hard drives, CPUs etc. These things everything can be redundant from the software level, hardware level, or you talk about the data center level. Yeah, Tariq? Okay, uh, finally on the uh, high availability with rack, one of the problems I see a lot of people make is, is that they just assume if we pay the fee to buy whatever licenses we need and we just install the media, it's all going to work. Um, you really need to have all of your people and processes updated for working in a high availability environment. For example, I used to go down to Dell corporate headquarters and do a lot of proof of concept with potential Dell customers. And what they would do is they would come in and say, I'm looking to replace a, a big Sun SMP box with you know, a 10 node Dell rack cluster. And they would send down two or three people to test it, drive it before they would buy it. But it always they would send people who had very little training or anything on rack and so what would happen is nine times out of ten these proof of concepts would fail not because of the technology but because the people weren't prepared and the process of sending people down unprepared you know that was where the failure is another place where you have to be able to handle this is it doesn't do the DBA any good if you become an expert on rack and then you don't share that knowledge or transfer it to the people in your op center. Uh, it does because if at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, they're going to call you and tell you, hey, uh, you know, what about my instances in the cluster went down? How do I fix it? What does this mean? It's better just to go ahead and educate them so that you can minimize or mitigate the number of times that they uh, pester you in the off hours. So everybody, uh, including the management, needs to understand the people, the processes, the techniques, the escalations. Everyone has to have the right mindset. You just can't buy high availability. You have to live it. Next slide, please. I think one of the things that's the most important is as you look to do your service level agreements with your customers, in other words, where you're putting your reputation on the line, you really need to have done that destructive testing that we talked about earlier so that you understand the architecture and infrastructure that you've deployed and that you've done it with your application and the key activities that you might be required to do. For example, if you've got to do change control or you've got to do Oracle patches or an Oracle upgrade, you have to understand how all of those work in a high availability environment before you agree to an SLA. Otherwise, you could be painting yourself into a corner and really damaging your reputation with your customers. Next slide. Now we've talked a little bit about monitoring RAC. 
and it is important to establish a baseline. In other words, um, when my engine is running well, how does it perform? Because if you don't have that background or that baseline, sometimes it's difficult to spot a deviation as being a problem. It might not show up in some monitoring tool as red, but it might show up in the end result of your customers having slower response times. So you have to know how the system behaves when the high availability environment is working perfectly so that you can understand every little nuance of when it's not working perfectly. Again, the interconnect, the next to the last bullet item, I find that nine times out of 10 or eight times out of 10, when people are having problems with RAC, I can start there and usually find the problem fairly quickly. And then a lot of people add, ask the question of, well, when do I know I need to add another node? And typically, if you've got greater than 70% CPU utilization, that's probably a good point. And that would, that would be regardless of whether the node was physical or virtual. In other words, the same logic can apply there. Next slide, please. 